Ignition sequence start. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Hello? You play to win the game. I mean, listen, we're talking about practice. Not a game, not a game, not a game. We're talking about practice. To LeBron James! That was insane! Officially insane, LeBron James! Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Claws to the Wall, where we bring you all the latest news on Texas State Athletics and San Marcos High School Athletics. I'm your host for this episode, Ethan Quintero, and joining me today is Gage Sutton. How's first, it going? <laughs> first timer, Courtney Abraham. How y'all doing? And of course, me, I already said my name, but let's go ahead and jump into it with Texas State Volleyball. Uh, this past weekend, the Bobcats squared off with Houston Baptist twice, winning the first game uh, with a sweep 3-0 and the second game 3-1. Uh, with these wins, Bobcats extend the record to five wins and only one loss little bit of a note here uh that's a lot better than last season start the first six games they were two and four and they still went on to finish 24 and nine which was a really good record and 14 and two in the conference so so far a fantastic start to the season for these girls so i'm gonna ask you all a question to start off what do you attribute this early success to guys you want to go first or you want me to go first ah, i'm cool uh yeah let me talk about it a little bit uh coach I, I think the big reason why volleyball has been playing so well is uh, Coach Hewitt has been amazing for them. Uh, mm -hmm. He's been in the system for a long time. He knows uh, that this is a team that has a long history of winning a lot of games and uh, kind of he, he's keeping that culture going, that Texas State volleyball expects to be winning games. Uh, so like you said, a really great start uh, compared to last season. And another thing that I think it could be attributed to is just how deep this, this team is. Like, they are stacked from top to the bottom of the roster. Uh, you have girls like Emily DeWalt and uh, – oh, my God. <laughs> I, I'm having a uh, brain fart. Uh, oh, Tyranny Scott, Caitlin Butner, Janelle Fitzgerald, all of them are playing really well right now. Mm -hmm. And, uh Yeah. So with me, what I think contributes to the Bobcats volleyball team success is building a culture of winning. And I feel like the coach is doing a great job of doing that. Cause you, as you can see, you can tell by this early great start how Emily DeWatt, she last week, she beat her, I think she broke a record last week, one of her personal records. And I think that's the most biggest thing because I see the team having great chemistry as I saw the uh, when they played, having a brain fart, what did they play? The they play, oh, they played, uh, yeah, HBU, mm -hmm. yes, HBCU, it's not HBCU, my bad. But I, I seen how great the team was playing together, and you could tell the chemistry is there. And I think the coach is doing a great job by bringing the team together and building a style of winning, yeah. And I think what also helped them is getting that they had an early loss to UTEP. Uh, I think it was two weeks ago they lost in four sets and it was kind of an upsetting uh, loss for them. It had been like the first time they had lost and there was like 15 game win streak at home. They were playing unbelievably at home and they lost and it was kind of a sloppy game from them. And Coach Hewitt was very upset with the way they played and the girls were too. So I think from here on out, you're going to see a hungry team and they're not going to want to lose like that again. Yeah, it's absolutely right. Since then they've been a lot better um, so I think that really propelled them forward as a team to buckle down and then see what they can do. And I like what you said about the coach, because for a long time we had, I forget her name. Who was Karen Chisholm. Karen, Karen Chisholm. Chisholm. And the adjustment has not been stressful at all. It has not like needed time to, to settle. It's just they put him in the seat and they've gone and they've sprinted with it and they've, they've done absolutely amazing. Um, second question for you guys. Who do you think the MVP of the season has been? Courtney, you want to go first? <laughs> I'm, I'm hands down Emily DeWatt hands down I agree I think Emily DeWatt has played really well uh I think if we're going with the obvious pick she's going to be the one but I think a dark horse for this award could be uh Tyranny Scott I think Tyranny Scott's been playing really well and honestly you could have your pick of the litter all of these girls have been playing really well uh but the one that really stuck out to me when I went to the game last Saturday it was Tyranny Scott she was uh just really crucial to the team's success in uh, Friday's matchup and definitely in Saturday. Cause I think 
they did a clean sweep on Friday where they won mm-hmm. three straight sets. And then Friday or Saturday, it was a four, uh, three, one. So yeah. just four sets. It's like, mm-hmm. I mean, <laughs> you can't ask for anything better, basically. Yeah, they're absolutely right. They're dominating. And I agree that Emily DeWalt is the MVP. She has 249 of the team's total 305 assists. That's crazy. She is dominating. She's a team player, and I love to see it. And another, my dark horse would be Janelle Fitzgerald. Yeah, Um, absolutely. Yeah. She she leads the team in kills with 80 and also leads the team in blocks with 18. So really the whole team is playing well. But if you had to pick one, I'd go with Emily DeWalt. Because from an impact perspective, not looking at the stats, she's just head and shoulders above everybody else. Yeah. Um, so moving on from volleyball, their next game is this Friday, September 25th. It's a doubleheader against ULM at home, one at 11 a.m. and then one at 6 p.m. Yeah. Um, and ULM is only one at two overall. And both of their losses came to teams that Texas State has already beaten, SFA and Houston Baptist. What were you going to say, Gage? I was just going to say, you can expect ULM to go down in this series. They're going to get crushed by the Bobcats. And I, that's not bias. I'm just saying, like, the analyst in me is just saying, this Texas State volleyball team is hungry, and they're going to be going for that win on Friday and Saturday. Most definitely. I can't see how the Bobcats can lose. They're on such a high streak. <laughs> I just can't see it. I mean, I guess- SFA, they got swept by Texas State. And then mm-hmm. SFA went and swept ULM. So, it the stats don't help them at all. Yeah. Yeah. This is about Especially, coming out, not underestimating ULM either. No, no. I, I still think they're going to crush them, though. Yeah, I do too. But <laughs> Oh, no, most definitely. <laughs> <laughs> most definitely. <laughs> all right. Moving on to our next sport, we got SMHS, or San Marcos High School, football. Um, and the Rattlers will look to start the season off with a win this Friday uh, with their season over against New Braunfels High School. And the big story this offseason was the resignation of head coach Mark Soto and the hiring of coach John Walsh. So I'm going to ask both of you, how significant is this new head coach? I can start for it. Yeah, I yeah. think it's very important because Coach Walsh, he has a history because he was recently from Den Guy and he built that team from the ground up to winning some state championships in Den. But with this San Marcos team, he's building a culture because I – had the opportunity to come out to one of his practices and you can show, you can tell that the players are really locked in and buying into what the coach is selling to them. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, yeah, I actually haven't had a chance to make it out to practice, but I was able to make it out to a lot of San Marcos high school basketball games last semester. And they're going with this new kind of era of coaching for not just football, for, for basketball, they're trying to make and uh, volleyball too, uh, with coach, uh, Teo. They're trying to build a monster where every team at San Marcos High School is going to be competitive. Every team is going to be pushing for the playoffs every uh, every season. And football is no different. I think uh, Coach Walsh is going to be a great addition to the coaching staff or the head coach. And he's really going to propel these players to be a lot better than, um, you know, than I think the ceiling was for them with Coach Soto. And not to uh, crap for lack of a better word, on Coach Soto. Because no, absolutely he, not. He was a great coach. He absolutely was. He took him from one and nine, was his first season there. And then about five or six seasons later, he went 10 and two. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But then the past two seasons, they were just one and nine and kind of stagnant in this, in this area where they didn't know how to get better. So I think a coaching change is going to help them culture-wise. And I think everyone's excited, like you said. Yeah, exactly. And uh, again, uh, we love Coach Soto at KTSW. Mm -hmm. He's always been super supportive of us. But with Coach Walsh, he brings a championship pedigree to this team that they haven't seen in a while. And I don't think they've seen ever. Uh, So with Coach Walsh in the mix, I mean, obviously, it's a tough district. They will be playing Mm -hmm. Lake Travis and Westlake, who have multiple state championships under their belt. But you can expect San Marcos to be competitive within the next few seasons. And I went to a lot of their games last last season. And uh, I don't have the stats on it, but almost all of their losses were so close. Like they mm-hmm. had the talent and they were able to get – like if they were fall behind, they'd come back like the Dallas Cowboys did last Sunday. We're oh, not going to get into the Cowboys. Uh, we're not going to get into that. <laughs> Don't start on that. they have coming back in games like the Cowboys do, uh, but unfortunately they could never close them out. So I think with this new head coach, uh, I, I think that – that's going to change and they're going to start getting a little bit more wins because mm-hmm. they have, they have the talent and um, a couple of those starters like Cannon Webb, Caduso, Goodbossi, 
you know, they're going to be really impactful. But who do you guys think is going to, you know, be that impact for San Marcos High School? Yeah, I could start. I'll go with Isaiah DeLeon. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I, every good football team starts with a good quarterback. And with a good quarterback, Isaiah DeLeon is coming in. He's going to be a sophomore this season. And from what I've seen – and or from what I've heard from our uh, San Marcos High School expert, Jude McLaren, we're really excited about this kid. Uh, Isaiah DeLeon plays basketball under Coach Pinchback, and I got a chance to see him, and he is oozing athleticism. Uh, Jude tells me he has a really good arm, and I'm expecting him to be one of the star players for San Marcos High School this upcoming season. I'm having a – I'm trying to remember this the wide receiver name. Nathan Henry. Nathan Henry. Nathan Henry, I think that's going to be the star player for this year. Because from what uh, Jew told me, he told me that um, you can see the difference in him because he put a little body weight on him. He's gotten taller, and his route running has been crazy. Mm -hmm. I was able to see a practice when uh, they was doing one-on-ones, and I, you could see that. You can see the progress in him. So I think that's going to be the star for the uh, Rattlers offense. And like, like I said with Isaiah, uh, both, the, both Nathan Henry and Isaiah played under uh, Coach Pinchback. So they have that chemistry already playing basketball together, but having them together playing football. And I think it's both of their like main sport. I think Isaiah and Nathan are both mainly uh, football players. Uh, they play basketball on the side, but it's going to be really exciting to see these two connect on passes this season. Now, I don't know Isaiah DeLeon. I don't know what his game's like. Obviously, you two know him a little bit more than I do. Does he have the uh, potential to be like a dual threat, maybe like Kyler Murray is right now? Or do you think he's more of a pocket passer? It's kind of hard to say because he didn't get a lot of playing time last year. He was on varsity, but he didn't get a lot of playing time. He wasn't the starter. Um, from what I've heard from Jude, uh, it's going to be a mix. I think that um, he, he's he's not – really really tall so i wouldn't expect him to be uh purely in the pocket but he uh he will definitely prove to be a playmaker on on the field regardless of uh what his play style might be classified as um i could see him like more of like a Kyler murray type because like uh gay said he's not that tall so what I've seen, witnessing him in practice, he's kind of like, they had design plays of him kind of like doing little read options, mm -hmm. little bootleg passes to help him uh, see a little bit better. Because he's not, I think he's about like 5'8", and the line's probably some six foot, some 5'11". So I think he'll have like a Kyler Murray style to him, a little dual threat. Hmm. I look forward to it. I bet it's going to be very exciting this Friday, and you can catch the broadcast at 6 p.m., on KTSW 899 or watch, I believe we have a visual version that you can actually watch the game on vibe.com. Yep. Or you can just go to the game at Rattler Stadium here in San Marcos. Go to the game. <laughs> go to the game. Yeah, they're exciting. Guys. Very, very much so. And let's move on to our favorite topic, obviously, Texas State <laughs> football. Uh, certainly, last Saturday, the Bobcats put on a show <laughs> beating ULM 38-17 to 17 behind Tyler Vitt's remarkable performance. That's something we haven't been able to say that often. Remarkable performance from Tyler Vitt. <laughs> uh, he went 14 of 21 passing, 256 yards, two touchdowns, and zero interceptions. Yeah, that's got to uh, be a record. That's the right? crazy stat for me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so what do you guys think? What does this win mean for Tyler Vitt going forward? Well, from uh, what's being said on Twitter and uh, B pages for San Marcos uh, or for Texas State football and stuff like that, it's saying that Brady and Tyler, Brady McBride and Tyler Vitt are going to be sharing snaps on uh, Saturday against Boston College. Uh, I guess Tyler Vitt showed enough against uh, ULM to prove that he could be a starter moving forward. I thought the battle was already kind of like the QB battle was already finished and decided. Um, but I don't know. I guess we'll see. I think this, what this means for Tyler Vitt is it builds his confidence up. He got this great game under his belt. So he's already coming off that momentum from the ULM game. Like you said, he, he threw 21 passes and completed 14 of them with zero interceptions, which is great. And I think that just helped boost his confidence. Yeah. Go ahead, Gage. Oh, no, I was just going to say, despite that, 
I think I, I, I don't want to take anything from Tyler Vitt. I think Tyler Vitt played really well against ULM. But can we talk about the wide receivers for Texas State? Jeremiah Haydell, Marcel Barbie, and uh, Jer- uh, Jamari Sharid, or K-Dot, as we like to call him at KTSW, and I'm pretty sure everyone knows his nickname. But <laughs> yes. those guys have been playing really great, and they've been such a help to Tyler Vitt because they made some really great catches that probably could have gone down as incompletions if, I mean, they weren't as good as they are. <laughs> um I, I I know we all saw uh, Marcel Barbie's catch, the one that bounced off the defender, and he caught it. It was on Sports Center. Um, Jeremiah Haydell's all the plays he makes. Like, I think they kind of bail him. Uh, I don't want to say bail him out because I do think Tyler Vitt was on the money for the most part uh, for the whole game. But I I do think it helped a lot to have a uh, a wide receiver core of that caliber. I agree. Jer- Jeremiah Haydell's having a B season. Yep, yeah, a real B season. Minus the catches and then all the highlights, I seen I seen like a different Bobcat team really. From this is a whole different Bobcat team from last mm-hmm. year. You could tell the wide receiver core is ready. They're eager. They're tired of losing. They're ready to win. And you could tell the defense that locked in. They ready to play every week, and they always come out and show out. The, the defense has been never been a problem. It's more so the offense. And from the offense standpoint, the offense is looking amazing. From I last year's standards, amazing. Yeah, I agree. And we talked about this last semester on the podcast, Gage. You were there when we, um, we kind of previewed this upcoming football season and what we expected from them. And mm-hmm. we all agreed that this was, should be technically a uh, coach's first season because he's had them. These are his recruits. These are his guys. This is um, the first time that he's in the quarterback's room. First time he's calling the plays. So this season to me is like the first one that shows what kind of coach that he is and what kind of change he's making for Texas state football. And so far it looks pretty good. And I hate to be the defender of Tyler Vitt here, but oh boy. <laughs> I'm going to be. Cause we can't forget. He also rushed 11 times for 91 yards and touchdown led all rushers that game. And He's playing really well. And from the one game I watched Brady McBride, I only watched the one against SMU. 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 I mean, he played well, don't get me wrong, but I felt like he was maybe a little bit weak in the knees in the pocket. He kept moving around. He threw a lot of passes into the ground. He kind of went through his progression slowly. And Tyler Vitt came out, and he's been playing pretty well, even in the loss, the double overtime loss. He played pretty well, and he came back in the second half, and then – Unfortunately, we missed a couple field goals, and here we are with a loss. But I, I think he's been playing pretty well. What's up, Gage? Listen, I think Tyler Vick played really well. And no disrespect to ULM. <laughs> they, were, they are a good football team. But SMU was a whole different monster. Their defense was all over Brady McBride, and the offensive line had probably that first game jitters. Brady McBride was basically running for his life the whole first half. Uh, the offensive line didn't really pick up its plates of the second half. And then that's when you saw Brady McBride start to pick his play up. Um, so I'm not saying that. I, I actually, I am saying that. I think Brady McBride probably would have played as well or better than Tyler Vitt in the ULL game. In the ULM game. Um, and you're going to need a quarterback who's going to play well against Boston College this upcoming week because Boston College is going to be bringing the heat. They played really well against Duke last week. Uh, their quarterback is uh, – <laughs> he's pretty good too. Phil Dracovic, he's, uh, he's a baller. So just just be ready for Texas State to struggle against Boston College. He did throw 300 yards for two touchdowns, uh, Jakovic, yeah. in their last game against Duke. And uh, I think he only threw one interception. Yeah. But mm-hmm. that's still one more than Tyler Vitt. Hey, I'm not going to defend okay. him oh, all season long. <laughs> but the dude played pretty well so far this season. But I don't think splitting up the snaps is that good of an idea. I'd just give Brady McBride the whole game. Because you got to get into a rhythm as a quarterback. And if you keep putting him in for a quarter, taking him out yeah. for a quarter, it's just he's never going to yeah. find that momentum. And it, it kind of throws everybody off. Yeah. And another thing that I wanted to mention, I know that I talked about it on Bobcat Radio on Wednesday, is against Bo- or Boston College played Duke last week. And Duke has a pro style quarterback, very similar to the way Tyler Vitt plays. And they got crushed. I, I mean, that, there's no other way to say it. Duke got crushed. So I'm thinking, hey, we got a dual threat quarterback on our team who was going to be the starter heading into the season and played really well against SMU. 
Most definitely. Let's throw them into the game, throw a wrench into their defense, because they're probably preparing for Tyler Vitt. I, I don't know what Boston College's plan is, but mm-hmm. if they're expecting Tyler Vitt, you throw Brady McBride in there, it's going to throw them for a loop, and they're going to be struggling all day to see, like, how the offense changes because of the change at quarterback. I agree. I think Brady McBride should start and not have to give up any snaps uh, because technically, and I wait, know wait, I'm wait, not, weren't you just on the Tyler Vitt train, bro? I am on the, I, I'm on the Vitt train. I just want to defend Brian. him because he didn't play well and you can't deny okay, that okay. he's been playing well. And yeah, he has, but I'm not going to sit up here and deny that he played an entire season last year and <laughs> yeah, <laughs> awful. I don't think nobody who got to Texas State will forget about that. <laughs> yeah, so I'm, I'm not going to defend that, but I, I am going to defend his last couple games here. But I do think Brady McBride needs to start against Boston College, especially since they, they allowed zero touchdowns through the air and forced two interceptions. It doesn't mm-hmm. sound like a Tyler Vid, like. Well, it sounds like well, something he wants to do. <laughs> exactly. It's something Tyler Vitt's been notorious for, throwing interceptions. And if you put him up against the Boston College, who's been really good at forcing turnovers, I mean, it just sounds like a recipe for disaster. It does. Uh, next question for you guys. Um, the defense, they did a great job against ULM, especially with the run game. They held the team to just 67 total rushing yards. That's all of like four of the running backs that they had just, you know, taking turns back there in the backfield. Uh, but they still gave up 377 yards and two touchdowns through the air. So is this going to become a problem, do you think, long-term when they start seeing these better quarterbacks like Dracovic, who we're seeing this Saturday? Uh, No, I don't see it being a problem. Bobcats always come up with turnovers. Even last week, I think they had uh, a a couple of like forced fumbles. And a pick six at the end of the game, too. Exactly. So I don't see how next week, coming into this week, actually, would be a problem for the Bobcat defense at all. And, I mean, we talked a a little bit about Jerkovic, and he played really well. Uh, So I'm a little nervous. I do think that uh, there is the opportunity for him to play really well against Texas State. But at the same time, I feel like there are playmakers. And at the end of the game, at the end of the day, it's going to matter who wins the turnover battle which is going to be really important between the quarterbacks because, again, if whoever's starting, Tyler, Mc, uh, Tyler uh, Vitt or, May, or Brady McBride, they need to take care of the football. And the same way, same thing is going to be told to Phil Dracovic. You need to take care of the football. And I honestly think the winner is going to come down to uh, who has less turnovers. All right. That being said, Texas State's next game is Saturday, September 26th at 5 p.m at Boston College and they are 1 and 0 so far this season with their only win coming the Duke win that we were just talking about. Mm-hmm. Um so we haven't ever played them before but who do you guys think's going to win because there's not really like a bunch of information we could look back on so. Mm-hmm. Who are they playing next week again? Boston Duke. College. Oh yeah, Boston oh. College. <laughs> Oops. Oh my bad. <laughs> That's going to be a real battle. I believe so. That's going to be a real battle for a battle for the Bobcats. But if I would have to choose, I'm going Bobcats hand down, hands down. Bobcats. <laughs> especially okay. Brady, especially Brady McBride, man. You okay. got, they got my vote. I like the pick, but I have a feeling that uh, Boston College is, uh, it's not one of the best football teams in the nation, but it's on a, I think it's on a different level uh, than Texas State is that I, I think if you ask me this later on in the season where Texas State has gained a little more momentum, I could tell you Texas State. But right now at this very moment, I have a gut feeling that Boston College might take this in a close one. I believe in that defense, but I, I don't believe in Boston mm. College offense at all. all I've right. seen Boston College offense. It's not that too – it's all right, but it's not too crazy where – I feel like that Texas State could compete. All right. I think they'll compete. I think they'll keep it close all game. But. Exactly. That's why. I think it's going to be a high-scoring game. Uh, my heart says Texas State, <laughs> and I'm <really laughs> sorry. my heart says Texas State, especially since Boston College has no run game at all. So our defense is really good against the run, so they're really not going to get anything going on the ground. But I think it's going to be a shootout between both quarterbacks, and it's going to be a high-scoring game. But I'm going to go with Texas State. I'm going with Courtney. That's a right choice. <laughs> right. I guess we'll have to see next week, guys. I guess we'll have to meet up on Close to the Wall and 
talk about <laughs> who yeah. ends up being right. <laughs> I'm tell you how my I'm tell you how my pick was right too, Gage. I ain't gonna lie to you. All right, all right, all right. <laughs> Wait, Courtney, are you gonna change your pick if Tyler Vitt comes out and he's starting? <laughs> nah, nah. <laughs> nah. All, right. all right, that's fair. I'm, I'm gonna stay true to my vote. I respect it. All right, we got about six minutes left, so I think we should get into a little bit of pro sports here, something that everybody loves and it's always fun. So NBA basketball. Gage, I know you were excited to talk about the Nuggets. So why don't you go ahead and start talking about the Nuggets? (laughs) All right. Well, let me talk about the Nuggets because they pulled off a big game three win. Um, I mean, they were pulling away for a little while and the Lakers came back and were looking like the comeback kids. But ultimately, Denver won with some big plays by Jamal Murray towards the end of the game. Uh, He found Paul Millsap on a last second pass under the basket. Who Paul Millsap just... uh, you know, dunked it down. And Jokic is always, I I don't know if this is a bold statement, but I do think Jokic is the best offensive center in basketball at the moment. Um, I agree. I agree. mean, I, I just think. I guess AD? Anthony Davis? I'd call him a power forward. I think he's, I think AD's a power forward. I'm saying like at, at the true center position, Jokic is unmatched. Uh, I don't think anyone can beat him offensively. And you can see that the Lakers are having problems with it too. I give you that. Jokic is very skilled. He's very skilled for his yeah. size and how slow he is. He's very skilled. <laughs> he's very technical. So he's, I give you that. He is very skilled. And the stat that really stood out to me against or for this game was, I think AD finished the game with two rebounds. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. That was one and of his worst games. One mm-hmm. of his worst rebounding games. And I mean, if you look at the stats, Denver destroyed them on the boards. Mm-hmm. Uh, Lakers bigs only had, I think, four combined rebounds between Dwight Howard, JaVale McGee, and Anthony Davis. Like, yeah. Yeah. If you're the Lakers, you need to start prioritizing rebounding because rebounding is important in the game of basketball. If you're not getting rebounds, you're letting second chance points go up. And, uh, you put yourself in a situation where you have to come back 20 points. And I mean, they came back, fell a little bit short, but you don't want to put yourself in that position if you're the Los Angeles Lakers. I agree. The Lakers also lost the free throw battle, which I don't know how that can happen when you have LeBron James and Anthony Davis and LeBron's the greatest driver of the basketball of all time. And Anthony Davis, you know what Anthony Davis does, put him on the low block. Nobody can guard him. Jokic is great, but he's not a defensive stopper. Not at all. At all. (laughs) But LeBron's not a great free throw shooter. I think LeBron shoots like 76%. No, he's a horrible free throw shooter, but he's exactly the line. Well, getting fouled, you're still getting to the line. Yeah, that's different. (laughs) (laughs) Because, I mean, like 76% is bad, but we like getting to the line is still important. If you're not getting to the line, I mean, even if you're only making 76% of your free throws, that's still points that. Um, you know, come from the free throw it line. Puts, and those are easy points. So it puts Denver in foul trouble, and then it yeah. slows down the tempo yeah. because Denver's sprinting all up and down the court, and then the Lakers are, you know, a half. You know, Jokic team. can't keep up running down, up and down yeah. the court. <laughs> That's what he I'm gets saying. the yeah. <laughs> He chucks that thing all the way down the court, and he just waits. He doesn't have to run. He just turns around with his one hand to pass and throws it yeah. all the way down the court. Well, yeah, I, I'm glad you brought that up because actually in game one, that's what happened. That's exactly what happened. Uh, the foul trouble for the Nuggets. I mean, Jokic had like four or five fouls in the third quarter mm-hmm. and it really affected them going into it. I think they got blown out in the first game. So, yeah. um, but Jokic figured it out and he played a lot better in game two and game three. And ah, the series is going to be exciting to watch. I, I think ultimately the Lakers will win. I think it'll probably go to six or seven. I think the Lakers will ultimately make it to the finals, though. I think. Yeah. Go ahead. Sorry, Courtney. Go ahead. <laughs> now, now, I'll just agree with Gabe. I definitely think you can't stop LeBron. LeBron's going to mm-hmm. the finals. Even though how bad I want the Nuggets to win, <laughs> I, I know LeBron's going to win. You know, it's just so much fun to watch, though. And Jamal Murray. And honestly, that whole team. But, Jer- yeah, Jeremy really Jeremy. the whole Nuggets. The whole Nuggets yeah. team. I would love to see a Nuggets Heat finals. <clears throat> That'd be like uh, a I'm dream come true. <laughs> but <clears throat> I, I think LeBron's they're going to win, especially if the Lakers put Dwight as their starting center. I think that's a great adjustment because JaVale's too skinny. Jokic mm-hmm. is just pushing him down. So I think Dwight would do a lot better. So you well, think the Heat what? are going to beat the Celtics? No, oh, yes. Uh-huh. Yes. Mm-hmm. I don't know about that. The game, I think, just started. I think they're probably already up by 30. All right. Uh, <laughs> Gordon, Hayward, Gordon Hayward came back, and he's going to be the game changer. I'm just saying. You put your trust in Gordon Hayward? I mean, he played really well <laughs> no, in game no, three. No, 
I game mean, three, he has six points. I think he has six points, four rebounds. And it's another threat, though, is what I'm saying. The thing is, it opens up the floor for the other guys. Just, just trust me. I think the Celtics will come back and make it a series. <laughs> Who would you rather have as like your fourth option, third option, whatever? Gordon Hayward or Tyler Hero? Tyler Hero. No. Mm. Yeah, that's a tough one. Yeah. Tyler Hero, because I, I think Gordon Hayward's a better shot creator at the moment. He definitely is, but Hero's a shark I think, shooter. I don't think I'm gonna go with Tyler Hero because Tyler Hero is more skilled to me, and he's a better shooter than Gordon Hayward. So I'm gonna go with Tyler Hero. Because I follow Tyler Hero all the way from his high school career all the way to now. Yeah, when you play the Kentucky, too. I mean, I, I'm a big fan of Tyler Hero, too. But I'm just saying, like, when you have Kemba, you have Jason Tatum, Jalen Brown, Marcus Smart, Gordon Hayward. I mean, that team is deep. And They're very I think, much stacked. And the thing is, like, they have to respect Gordon Hayward's game. Even though he only had six points in game three, you have to respect him because there are games where he can go off. So I'm just saying, I think the Celtics will make it a series. I don't think the Heat will have a cakewalk the rest of the way. But I, I was just interested to hear that you think it's going to be the Heat, like, for sure. But I don't know. Maybe that's just... <laughs> I'd, like to see, I'd like to see it go seven games. I mean, I like both teams, but I just think the Heat are better, especially, like, on the defensive mm. side of the ball. That's true. They're deeper, too, as a roster. I think, yeah. like, they don't have... Uh, the Celtics starting five is better, I would say. But after that, the Heat are just so deep. Like, if one guy goes down, it's next man up mentality. And Jimmy Butler has been such a great leader for them. So, Gordon Drive is a huge problem for the Celtics. I y'all, love Gordon y'all, Drive. Y'all, y'all, do y'all see how crazy he be going? <laughs> <laughs> Gordon Drive is a real problem. They can they cannot stop Bam. Mm. Oh, they, they can't not stop Bam. They cannot stop Bam. And Daniel Tice is just praying that he gets hurt. Uh, the Celtics need a uh, need to go get, go into the offseason looking for a center. I would say uh, maybe try to trade for someone like Miles Turner. But Ooh, uh, I don't know if they're going to let him go unless they let Victor go. Well, I think they're looking to make Sabonis their starting center full time. Um, I think that I, I, I don't know. I, that's what I've heard. I think Sabonis. Uh, I, I personally like Miles Turner game. Miles Turner's game a lot. Me too. I would like to have him as the starting center of the Pacers. Um, but I don't know. Maybe the Pacers think differently. So who do you have winning the finals? Everybody, before we before we stop this podcast, who do you got winning the finals? Courtney, you go first, man. <laughs> I can't lie to you. If the Heat go, I'm going to have to say the Heat. I'm gonna have if to, it's Lakers? I'm going to have to say the Heat. Okay. I'm going to have to. All right, okay. I'm taking the Lakers. I think the Lakers are going to win it all. Over the Heat or over the Celtics? Either. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'd love to see if it's, a, if it's a Celtics. Oh yeah, I'm taking Lakers. But if it's a Heat, I'm taking the Heat. All right, all right. <laughs> I would. <laughs> I would love to see the Heat win. Man, <laughs> I probably Lakers is my head choice. Like my brain is telling me Lakers, mm-hmm. but once again, my heart, which is what I trust more than anything, is telling me the Heat. But your heart is saying the Heat over the Nuggets, because I mean, like if. If like <laughs> if it was completely up to me, like my fan favorite pick, it would be the Nuggets. Like the Nuggets would be doubt. awesome. I think I it would be so nuggets. fun to That'd see them win a championship. But That'd I don't be real know. interesting. Real- reality like is hitting me, and it's saying Los Angeles Lakers. So yeah, same here. All right, looks like that's all the time we have for this episode. So make sure you go and follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube at KTSW Sports. And as always, listen to our broadcast on KTSW eight nine nine for Courtney Abraham. Gage Sutton, I'm Mithy Quintero. So long, Bobcats.